Thanks, Diane. I'm actually here on behalf of more than 50 uh, University of Auckland researchers from uh, the Light Metals Research Centre and, and the Product Accelerator and other programs that we've run over the years. Um, and I, I've got five points that I want to run through, exemplify to try and um, show the way step changes in manufacturing can occur. The first one is that um, you have to be in the data stream. You have to see the problems every day that manufacturers and and I'm including materials processes of all all types. I'm including uh, designers, industrial designers. Uh, since uh, we, uh, we have some industrial designers in the room, I think um, all all of the step changes, any step change can only be made on the basis of of uh, inspiration and usually stimuli, and stimuli needs data, and you need to be in the data stream. And unfortunately, although we try, and uh, Katha Simpson's new company, Engender, will help, we need about another 100 or 200 of them. Um, the university is not in the manufacturing data stream, and we, we, f we struggle with that. Um, I I'll give you an, an example. Um, I guess, um, we were asked by Air New Zealand to, um, if we could produce a new generation of, of spare parts, because um, a, um, a certain spare part that I, I probably shouldn't say what it is, but, but you use it in, uh, in the um, uh, facility that uh, Debesh was referring to in the front of the airplane, apparently. Um, uh, it costs $8,000 to produce, takes uh, between six and 12 months to arrive in New Zealand, and then Air New Zealand can install it. We 3D printed them uh, for, I think it was $100. Um, they were better, stronger, had a better surface finish, uh, and went straight into the aeroplanes. Um, and to do that, though, we spent, before that, about uh, six or seven years working with uh, airframe uh, fit-out um, specialist designers in New Zealand companies to understand what were the types of issues with these uh, these fit out uh, of, of parts, and then we used a, the, the, a technology for additive manufacturing, digital um, production, to, to make them uh, at one of the uh, universities not too far from here. Um, so, uh, and we've had other many examples where, um, in the construction industry, um, the types of things like this frame here, or um, racking and piping for utilities is the first thing that fails in an earthquake because of the, um, the, 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 the lack of damping in those structures as, as the building sways. And uh, we, we, with that knowledge, we were able to design um, some damping structures and uh, 3D print them by uh, another technique, fused deposition modeling, with the right modulus so that they damp the vibration. Two stiff structures don't do that. But uh, overseas, they made stiff structures using selective laser sintering, which didn't work because they didn't have the right modulus um, stress-strain relationship. So these things can only uh, be done if you're in the data stream. And I guess that's the first learning that we've had. Um, you need to be out in the laboratories that are in factories. In fact, your laboratory probably will be a factory, not a, not a laboratory in the university. And that's a bit of a cultural thing for the universities uh, to, to sort of take on board. Um, but it's, it's essential. Um, you know, a, a practitioner, or rather a university researcher like myself, might see two or three manufacturing problems a month. A practitioner uh, in a factory sees 20 or so a day the data stream, and they're, and they're different data. They're not published data in journals. <laughs> they're the real, the real problems that nobody knows about and don't get published. So you have to be there. Um, the second point about, uh, about step changes in manufacturing and referring to researchers here is, is that the big projects are both fundable and achievable within the university. Um, 
By big, I, I mean, uh, you know, what we've had in the last 14 years, four MB grants, uh, about $10 million each. Um, but to, to, to get the money, <laughs> you have to uh, not only say, but you have to actually achieve an outcome which is significant that, that warrants the investment of the money, which makes, I think, good sense, and MB uh, uh, do fund on that basis. Uh, but to do that, that means you have to have a team of 10 to 20 people. And the people have to be experienced in various areas, including in the community and especially in the community. So uh, if you're going to bid for that sort of money from MB, um, and, and if you're going to get a track record where you've actually managed to uh, achieve some of what you said you were going to, um, it means that you have to manage teams that are larger. You know, one or two people, it's difficult to do. It's difficult, it's not difficult to do some research, but it's difficult to get it applied. Um, and I guess the, the part, oh, thank you, one minute. Um, the, the part of this which is, which is tough is that um, our research is rather than applied, it's application inspired. So um, one of the inventions that one of my colleagues over here, Pratesh Patel's had a lot to do with is uh, heat exchanges where we had to take um, the heat transfer coefficient for a heat transfer fluid called air. Anyone, I guess everyone knows heat, air is a horrible heat transfer fluid. We had to take that heat transfer coefficient from 10 to 100, factor of 10, and we had to do it at very low air flows. So uh, that, was, that was the data stream that, that, that was in industry that, that the other researchers around the world couldn't hear. We heard it and we spent a long time in the university uh, working out how to do it um, and, and managed to achieve a, a new technology because of it. Um, those are two of the points. Um, next time, uh, maybe we'll have another two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>